If you're in a place where it is appropriate and comfortable for you to do so, please close your eyes and begin to take some slow, long, deep, relaxing breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. With every inhale, feel more light and peace entering the body and the mind. With every exhale, feel like you're allowing all tension to release from your body. Feel like gravity is just taking the tension away. Inhaling peace and light, exhaling all tension. We picture ourselves on top of a beautiful mountain in the center of a circular grove of trees. In the center of our circle, a bonfire blazes forth, lighting us and the grove up with a sacred golden light. We recognize that this is the light of perfect love and perfect trust, and it easily burns away everything that is not like itself, leaving us safe, relaxed, and serene. Into this sacred space, we invite the presence of our Creator. To many of us, our Creator reveals themselves to be a God and Goddess, a Mother and Father. We also invite the presence of our guides and our teachers, our angels. We ask that we be guided and led as we walk upon the way to become happier, more peaceful, more gentle, more prosperous, more healthy, more joyous, and more loving people. Thank you very much, and if it's appropriate for you to do so, you can join me out loud in saying, Blessed Be. Many of you have taken my 18-week course called A Witch's Primer. And this is basic training in what I call non-denominational witchcraft. What I mean by non-denominational witchcraft is that it's not attached to any religious structure or tradition. Some witchcraft traditions are a type of church within a religion called witchcraft. And a witch's primer doesn't come from the perspective of the craft being a religion, but as a craft as a spiritual craft, yes, but a craft, and a craft of magic that allows you to build your power and use your power, direct your power, and achieve results, magical results. One of the ways that we as witches or magicians or magical practitioners can access this magical power that we are building is through wand magic. And I have a whole lesson on wand magic in A Witch's Primer, but I thought we would bring that out and dust that off and talk about it because I think it's such an important part of the craft. Usually when we talk about wand magic and somebody that's either not of the craft or somebody that's a cynical (laughs) practitioner will roll their eyes and just say, oh, such superstition. And that's understandable because they don't understand what wand magic actually is. A lot of people believe that a magic wand has special powers that when waved will cause things to happen. And that's superstitious to believe that your wand has powers separate from you. But the wand as a magical symbol is very powerful and very ancient, And when used appropriately and wisely, wand magic can have some significant results. If you look at how our ecosystem is built, trees could be stated to be a major way that the sunlight is manifest on earth and how oxygen is produced. It's the mystery of photosynthesis. And as such, you could think of trees as being a type of spiritual helper that were placed on the earth. And there's a lot of history of magical people revering trees as being their magical helpers. The Druids are quite famous for this, as well as being famous for working wand magic. But all kinds of magical people revere trees as being a physical representation of spiritual assistance. And so it makes sense that a branch from one of these helper trees could be aligned with the magician to create extraordinary results for them. If you think in terms of what trees are, they are ultimately spirits. 
everything is. Everything alive has a spiritual counterpart. So the spirit of trees is a helper spirit. And you can't really find an example of unconditional love anywhere in the world as full and complete as what a tree is. The tree exists to do nothing but supply endless life to the earth in all kinds of ways that science still doesn't even understand. Science doesn't understand all the ways in which trees benefit our planet. And not only do the trees benefit us physiologically and allow us to live in an environment that is capable of sustaining life for our bodies, but they supply us with spiritual nourishment and assistance as well. So, if you're going to work wand magic, I recommend that your wand is made of wood that your wand is made of wood. It's very popular to have wands made of crystals and wands made of metal. And I'm not saying that you can't have those things, but to have a wand that is made of wood for the purpose of working wand magic, the kind of wand magic that we're talking about today, really is a smart idea. And I would encourage you to consider that. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can fashion or create your wand. You can find a twig on the ground or a branch on the ground. And when you find it, you just claim it as being your wand. And you can cut off the excess little branches. And you can even cut off the outer bark if you want. You can dry it. You can carve symbols in it or not. You can sand it down. You can varnish it. There's all kinds of ways that you can prepare your wand. Some people like a real rustic wand. Some people like a very ornate wand. You could add gemstones to it. You could add metals to it if you wanted to. You could wrap it in things. There's all kinds of ways. Some people will buy a wand that has been fashioned by a wand maker, and I think that's a wonderful idea. Some of these wand makers make some beautiful wands out of wood, but some people like to do their own, and some people like to not have anything carved in the wand. They want it to be very plain and very natural. And it doesn't really ultimately matter. The wood is there and the spirit of that wood is there no matter what you do to it. You've got to be careful of listening to the experts that tell you how to fashion your wand because they'll tell you that certain stones will make certain things happen, metals will make certain things happen. That all may have its place, but ultimately when you're working wand magic as we're talking about here today, you don't need anything other than that branch of wood. Now, ultimately, you could work this magic without a wand at all, and you will get to the point where you can choose to use your wand or not use your wand as you decide. But I would encourage anybody that's interested in this type of magic to actually have a wand that they consecrate for this purpose. Just the act of consecrating the wand, aligning with the wood in the wand, and beginning to understand magic from the point of view of a wand. And, and having that relationship with that spirit of the wood is something that is very challenging to do on your own without the wand. So we don't want to get superstitious about the wand, but at the same time, we don't want to discount the powerful symbolism of what it represents to us. There's different correspondences with different woods that people have come up with. And we have that in Angel Magic. We have that in which is Primer. I believe even in Beyond the Basics, there's some correspondences that include trees. And those things are appropriate. And so that's why some people will go crazy with their wands and they'll have a wand for prosperity and they'll have a wand for this and they'll have a wand for that. You can do that. But to me, that seems overly and unnecessarily complicated. What I would recommend is that you find a wand that you resonate with and allow it to supersede all other correspondences and recognize that's just the spirit of the wood that resonates with you. And you and that spirit are going to co-create your reality through this relationship. So to consecrate your wand, you're going to take your wand and attune it to to each of the elements. Now, this is where it's really important to understand the difference between the elemental air wand and the spell wand. Now, the elemental air wand is included in the beginning 
lessons on your tools in a witch's primer. And the elemental wand is a part of many different magical traditions. And there's a big controversy (laughs) between whether the wand should be attributed to air or to fire. And there's a controversy as to whether the blade or the athame should be attributed to air or fire. And from an elemental point of view, I tend toward air being wand and fire being athame, although I'm totally okay with people switching that if they need to. But to me, the element that something is supposed to have dominion over shouldn't be able to consume it. So fire will consume wood, whereas fire is the way out of which a blade is born. It is born from the fire. It is forged in the fire. So to me, it makes personal sense to have my blade be fire and the wand be air since most of the branches sit in the air all the time. They wave in the breeze. So to me, it makes more sense. But let's put all of that aside for this wand because this wand is not attributable to a single element. This wand is consecrated by all elements because it's not an elemental tool. It is a tool of pure magic working. So, to consecrate your wand, you're going to want to, first of all, understand which direction corresponds to which element. Now, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you'll probably change things. But for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, we tend to, and each tradition is different. And as long as you are consistent with your directions, it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. But usually, East is air, South is fire, West is water and north is earth. That's pretty common practice. So we're going to just assume that those are your directions. And if they're different, that's fine. So to consecrate your wand, in the north I have a dish of salt. In the east I have either some incense or some spray perfume. In the west I have a little bowl of water. And in the south I have a burning candle. So I go into the north first, and I sprinkle a little bit of salt onto the wand, and I say, I dedicate and consecrate this wand to the element of earth. And then I either move or just turn to face the east, where I see the either the incense or the mister, and I consecrate it by waving it through the smoke or misting it with a fragrant mist, like perfume or flower water. And I say, I dedicate this wand to the element of air and to the direction of the east. Then I turn to the south, and there's the candle burning. And I move the wand through the candle flame gently, being careful not to scorch it with the candle. And I say, I dedicate this wand to the element of fire and the direction of the south. Then I move or face to the west, where there's that bowl of water that I set there. And I sprinkle the wand with the water as I say, I dedicate this wand to the element of water and to the direction of the west. I move to the center of my circle, I raise my wand up high, and I say, I dedicate this wand to the heavens, and then I point it down to the earth, and I say, and I dedicate this wand to the earth. Now, you could say, I dedicate this wand to Father Sky and Mother Earth, if you're a little bit more religiously oriented. Then you want to name your wand. Now, I prefer to ask the wand its name, but you can name it if you prefer. The tradition is, it's a very ancient tradition, I believe it's Druidic, where you, by calling on the wand's name, you are aligning yourself with the spirit of the wood, the spirit of the tree. So, once you've consecrated your wand, what I would do is get very quiet and ask for the name of the spirit of the wand, and then just listen, and you'll feel something. And you'll hear something. Jot it down in your diary or your BOS so you don't forget it. And each time you're going to do some wand magic, you want to link up to the wand by either out loud or mentally repeating its name. Now, once you've finished your consecration and your naming, then you just wrap up the wand and put it away. And you can wrap it up in some silk or something special. If you don't want to call attention to the wand, make sure that you put it away in a way that's not too ceremonial, if you're at a place where you can't have a lot of witchy stuff. I've known people for their wand that they've consecrated a pencil or a chopstick, 
you know, that, that just because they didn't want to be calling attention to themselves. I've known several people that have gotten wooden conductor batons, like for an orchestra conductor, and used that as their wand, just because it wouldn't be as telling if something like that were found. But many of us don't mind having a wand around, and we just put it away and keep it private. Now, what do you do with this thing? It's there to help you cast spells, very powerful spells. You can either just do wand magic, or you can incorporate wand magic into your other workings. And it's very simple. You use the wand to help you create a thought form. So when you're ready to cast a spell with your wand, the first thing you want to do is pull the the wand out and call on its name, either silently or aloud. And I just say, I call upon the spirit of my wand and I name it. And once you've done this, then you are ready to cast a spell. You know how to cast a spell from all of the different lessons that you've learned. But just to recap, you want to relax your body. You want to form some sort of a mental picture in your mind of what you want. Usually, I like a small scene proving to my deep mind that the thing has already occurred. For instance, if I'm trying to sell a house, I have a scene where I'm getting congratulated by my realtor on the great sale of the house or something like that. And I just repeat it over and over again in my mind. I usually have some sort of little incantation to keep my mind focused. Oftentimes, I try to make it rhyme and a very small incantation just to keep my mind focused. And I also, as part of that experience, I conjure the emotion, the feeling of what I would feel had my spell already come true. So, between the visual and the incantation and just conjuring that feeling, I try to keep that up for just a few minutes. During the part of the spell where you are visualizing and all of that, have not only the image of in your mind of what you desire, but some sort of a symbol that's going to encapsulate that desire. It could be as simple as a dollar sign for money. In my little booklet on the magic of Psalm 119, it gives you some Hebrew letters. So you could, if you're learning how to write the Hebrew letters and what each of those Hebrew letters mean, you could use a Hebrew letter. If you're working on your cursive magic, you could actually write in cursive with your wand in the air, that which you desire. You can actually write the word as your symbol. Whatever it is, you're going to trace that symbol in the air while you're stating your incantation at the end of your visualization as a way to tie it all up. And not only are you then working with your power of the four magical bodies that you have built through all of your work here, but you are also connecting with that spirit of the wood. And remember, that spirit of the wood represents the great helper spirit that was given to us when this earth was created. The wood represents major help and assistance. You're not just simply waving a magic wand, even though that's what it can look like to an onlooker. You're actually using it to inscribe a symbol or words into the depths of your consciousness in order that that desire of yours come about in a very profound, very speedy, and very satisfying manner. You're really just inscribing into your deep mind this symbol through using this wand. It really cuts through a lot of layers of nonsense and gets you right down to the core of your will and your intention and your ability to change your life in a very positive way. So a lot of times people will hear about wand magic, like I say, and they'll just roll their eyes and they'll think, oh, that's so silly. And they don't understand that one of the reasons why it seems so silly is because people that have seen people through the ages working wand magic didn't understand what they were doing. Didn't understand. They just thought they were waving a wand. They didn't understand that they were inscribing something with the wand. They were inscribing it into reality. So it's not superstitious at all. It's a very powerful, potent, magnificent tool whereby not only are you using the powers of your own mind and your own energy bodies, but you're connecting with that great helper spirit that is a manifestation of infinite spirit's help for you. And the way that manifestation 
is shown in this world is through trees. So it's a big deal. <laughs> wand magic is a big deal. If you're using your wand to do just a thought form that you for something that you want to manifest, then you release it like you normally would. If you're doing a protective thought form for a building or a car or something like that, then you instruct it to stay in its place. If you are working with a talisman or an am- amulet, then you instruct that thought form to stay within that talisman or amulet until your spell has manifest, in which case you will destroy the talisman or amulet. So it's just like normal spell casting, but you are using one more very powerful element. Now, even if you don't 100% understand yet what wand magic is, you haven't had a lot of experience in it, just working with it will give you amazing results soon anyway, just because of the immense Akashic energy of working with a wand. There's nothing more magical than a magic wand. So just working with a magic wand in a serious way, not in a silly way, not in a frivolous way, but in a very serious way, aligns you with generation after generation of serious magical practitioners that have had great success from all kinds of different magical traditions. So remember that there's a great amount of Akashic energy with magic wands, as well as very practical benefit from using them even without the Akashic energy. So it's definitely something that many people misunderstand and they discount the potency and power of this practice, but it's worth your giving it some thought and giving it a try. It doesn't take a lot of effort on your part to consecrate a wand and use it. It takes some practice to get good at it, but it's practice that's well worth your time and effort. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I so appreciate you. Until next time, blessed be. Blessed be.